All right, let's uh, let's do this. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, hope you had a good weekend. I'm uh, doing the headphones this time. Earbuds are a little bit much sometimes. Uh, so, um, I just uh, took me a little bit of time to get those solutions up, uh, but I posted those on the uh, website. Although I didn't, I forgot to put them up on Canvas. They're they're on the external website, and I'll <clears throat> I'll put a PDF that PDF up on Canvas Canvas in uh, just a minute. Okay, so um, and I also just posted the grades on Canvas uh, for that problem set one. All right, so um, I think uh, people did pretty well in general. Um, probably, I mean, there was some, of course, there was some variation uh, from person to person. Um, I think there were there were probably so, some things where I think maybe it's sort of like uh, you know sort of suggestions that I would have um, going forward, and, and a lot of it. I mean, some of it is you know it only applies to certain. Uh, people, I mean, a lot of it, I think it's just general approach stuff was not like serious issues. Um, which I think, I think, I mean, I think it'll help sort of understand what I'm looking for in, in future problem sets. Um, so, I mean, one thing I noticed, uh, in the sort of most people was there is, some, I think there's some perhaps, confusion in terms of like the assumptions that we're making so there's you know in and, and, and I guess what I would say is you know there's the there are the general assumptions that we often have about what's the type of model we're looking at so like the general assumption would be we're looking at a Malthusian model okay and say um, you know in a Malthusian model you know you have some relationship you know between you know some this this l dot over l is going to be some function of of little y, right? So this is gl. It's going to be some function of little y. Uh, so I'm writing f here. That's just you know that could be anything. So in in the in the basic Malthusian model, like a while ago, you know we would write we wrote this as like theta times y minus y zero. So it was like you have some subsist subsistence wage y zero. Above that, you start getting population growth, and below that, you you, you get population loss. Okay, um, and that was like, um, yeah, and that, so that's that's like the pure sort of historical Malthusian model, right? And that one would look like you know if you had y zero here, it's just a straight line, which is supposed to run through that point. Uh, that's a bad, that's bad. Let's let's undo that. Um, so this is just going to be you know some straight line that runs that y0 point okay so that's like the core Malthusian model okay um, so but the general assumption right it's just that there's some basically this there's some relationship between how is population growing and what is your standard of living okay so this is like the first model pure Malthus that we looked at and then later on we're sort of like well that doesn't quite square with the data that we see Right in terms of if you look at countries today, it's actually the exact opposite of that. Okay, so then what's the deal? Well, probably the deal is that that was kind of a good approximation for a while, but then it sort of things change, right? So this is like low levels, right? And just to, I guess I should label my axes here too. Okay, Y and GL. So this is like here. This is like pure Malthus region. Mathis, Johnny Mathis, uh, pure Malthus uh, region. Um, and then up here is sort of like the modern region. Okay, so we can create a synthesis where it's like, okay, before it looked like sort of that pure Malthus and then later on it was decreasing, okay? And then like what was in the homework, you know, I, th I threw a little bit of a curveball for you, I guess, but, but what was in the homework rate right, was then, you know, probably it was something like, uh, well, it would and precisely, you know, it was basically that, um, that max function, right? So if the the homework, okay, we we said that um, basically you know, L dot over L was the max of like N one and N two minus I think it was theta times y, something like that. Okay, so it's basically the max of some constant 
and this decreasing function. Okay, so the, that decreasing function, this one here on the on the right side, this is this is that modern era, right, where higher standards of living means lower population growth, and this is just to make sure that we don't hit zero, right? That was the only point there. So so if you think, and we said that n two was greater than n one, so this one would look like okay, at zero. That right hand side is n two, which is greater than n one, so the max is n two, and then. You go down linearly, but then eventually you hit N1 and you just sort of bottom out there. Okay, and you go on there forever. All right, so like you can imagine the sort of, if it was just the right hand side, it would look like that dashed line keep going, but then we sort of, we bottom out at, um, uh, at N1. Okay, so that, that would be what the, the the homework one would look like. Okay, so um, yeah, so I, I think a, a lot of people sort of just had the, say, you know, the second one, which is, I mean, that's a good function. Um, but it's, you know, it's like, that's the general assumption. You know, the specific assumption is important to keep in mind what that is, right? Uh, let me just see, we got a chat here. Uh, is this pre-recorded? Let's double check. Yes, it is recording, but um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, it's always a danger of me forgetting. So, um, okay, so, so yeah, the general assumption is just that there's some relationship here. And then the specific assumption varies depending on, I don't know, how you're feeling that day or like how we want to analyze this, okay? Um, I mean, in some sense, the number two here is sort of the most general one because it encompasses both of these, except that sort of, it encompasses both one and three, but it, at sort of the appropriate levels of income. Uh, but you know, you want to keep, you want to be careful when you're doing the problem, say, okay, you know, this is our assumption about GL, right? So we're working with this for now and we're gonna just completely Sort of elaborate or enumerate on what what are the implications of that, um, and then go from there. So so it's just I guess I you know just be careful about what we're assuming in the problem, and make you know and and they're going to be inspired by what we do in class. Okay, um, they're not going to be exactly the same, but they're going to be inspired. But you want to be careful that you don't sort of like bring in assumptions that we were making in class when the when I'm sort of replacing those. Okay, which is um, I mean it's it's you know I. You see, it's something that I see a lot, um, you know, over the years is, is just sort of like some confusion about when is it appropriate to make certain assumptions and not. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm not in this, so, so it's just really just, just kind of be careful about the assumptions on the problem. And I'll, I'll try and make everything mostly self-contained. Okay, so I, ideally, and this is usually I think I, I roughly achieve this, ideally it's sort of like there's not going to be any sort of loose ends where it's like, oh, what about, you know, what's going on here? Is, you know, is there technology? Is there population growth? I'll try and enumerate all of the, the different options that we have, right? Um, but but if it really seems like I missed something, then of course you can always email, you can always email me and, and ask or, or come to office hours, okay? So um, I think it's, yeah, that's my one suggestion. Um, and then the, the other one is just sort of like, uh, you know, show your work. Yeah, this, this is something that varies from person to person, but like, you know, be sure to show your work um, on on the derivations, okay? I, I know sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't know the answer and you're like, okay, I think this is what what's gonna happen. And that's pretty good, right? Um, to have some intuition. Um, but, you know, if you can, try and just go through derivations. Even if it doesn't work out, you know, it's good to see that you're sort of jumping in and trying to, to see how it works, okay? So like, you know, but, you don't necessarily have to prove everything from scratch, right? So remember, like, you know, we had this equation that we often used, which was like the growth rate of the standard of living under that sort of Cobb-Douglas assumption was gonna look like this. You know, if you, if you wanna say, okay, well, we showed this in class, so we're gonna use this, that's good. If you wanna prove it, that's cool too. Um, but, you know, stuff like that, you can say, well, we did this in class, I'm gonna use this, all right? Um, but again, sometimes, if I change, I may change the model, I may change the production function, for instance, and maybe this wouldn't hold always. Like, you know, so this this holds in the case where y is equal to z, k to the alpha, l to the one minus alpha, and k is fixed, okay? But, um, you know, and so you can, you can derive that expression for y, for a little y, okay, and get this growth rate. So, that, that holds in this case, but you know, it's not always gonna hold. So in the homework, it actually, this always held because we didn't change the production function. But you know, if I were to say, okay, what, what if we have say human capital and there or something like that, then you're gonna be, oh, well, okay, now this, this may not hold. 
and I need to, to go through and rederive what, what are the implications of that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that, that, yeah, but I think overall people did, did quite well. So um, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't want to sound negative here, right? So I, I think overall people did quite well, but I'm just saying in terms of how to adjust your approach, I think these two things are, are probably uh, good ideas. Okay. Um, all right, so then okay, that's sort of what I wanted to say on the homework. I would go over go over the solutions um, if you have time, uh, just to uh, see kind of the get an idea of how I would approach the problems, and hopefully I'll provide some guidance for the future. Um, for the, I mean, for the more kind of mathy stuff, I mean, it it it's more. It's more of the type of problem where there's kind of one way I, I think you should approach it, although there's always many ways, many different paths you can take to get to the same sort of end result. Uh, for the interpretational stuff, I mean, I'm not, I, I'll give you, a, you know, here are some ideas that I, I thought were reasonable, but usually with those, there's many different valid answers. And so that's not to say that if you didn't write exactly what I wrote in the solution, that it's, it's not correct, right? So, um, yeah, so so like for the part D questions, especially sort of like that, that's when you get more into the interpretation or, or the part A is where I'm asking you why might we assume this? That's again somewhere, there's no 100% clear correct answer there, okay? And then for some of them, even in the sort of algebraic derivation parts, you know, I, I might go a little wild and say, okay, here's, here's I'll keep going with this and, and you know, show you some, some other stuff. But I try to enumerate it saying like, okay, at some point I did this in the, in the solutions. Like you know, if you stop here, it's like a hundred percent perfect answer, I, I think, or I would, I would be very happy with this answer. I'm going to keep going, but so don't feel like you have to have everything that I wrote here, but you know, I'll enumerate what's sort of like what I would kind of expect versus just stuff that I, I think is also relevant. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So then let's, let's forge ahead here. Um, so I, I, I guess, I mean, I'm going to mostly talk today about this, these, this topic, which is, which we basically started at the end of last time, which is what I'll call sort of the, the question of causality. Okay. So, um, it's a pretty generally important topic in economics, um, especially kind of in the modern era. And when I say modern era, I'm talking, well, I don't know maybe the past 20 years or so, okay? Which is, you know, uh, I mean, I, econ as we know it, I mean, has been going on kind of for a while. Things got sort of more technical in the 50s, partially as a result of new mathematical techniques. And then things changed uh, rec more recently in terms of the empirics, okay? So that's, that's when I say the last 20 years, it's more of like this empirical changes, okay? So, so the, but the, this question of causality is, is really just a fundamental one to, to many fields, um, which is just like what, what actually is causing what. Okay. So we're, especially in a field like economics, where it's often macroeconomics, especially it's often difficult to run an experiment of any sort, or maybe unethical or something like that. Um, especially at scale. Uh, it's hard to determine what's causing what, you know, you see a bunch of stuff, you see a bunch of very, like, data variables moving around or just observations about the world. You see things changing and they're all changing sometimes in, in synchrony, right? They, they, you know, things happen at similar times, uh, but that doesn't mean that it, any given thing is causing anything else, right? So it's, it's hard to tease out when a bunch of stuff happens at once is, you know, did A cause B, did B cause A? Whether this, was there some sort of joint determination process? Okay, so kind of, well, first of all, that's a big problem, okay? Um, in a, in, a, in a mostly observational field like macroeconomics, um, and in some sometimes there's no way around it, right? Sometimes it's just like, well, 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 we can kind of sit around and theorize and and speculate and see if at least our theories are not wrong, maybe not provably right, but not 100% wrong. Uh, sometimes that's as good as you can do, uh, but other times there's ways you can kind of be clever or make small assumptions and also be clever. And, and infer, sort of validly infer uh, something about causality. Okay, so I'm being pretty general here. I'll be more specific with, with actual examples in a bit and actual approaches that people have taken. Uh, but, but right now I'm being pretty general. So, but, um, <clears throat> so yeah, and, and when I say, so like I refer to macro as observational, that means it's sort of like a situation where we're, we're kind of stuck with just looking at what happens. 
and, and inferring what we can. Okay, so, you know, another mostly observational field would be like astronomy, right? You can't go out and create a star and, you know, make a supernova happen or whatever. You know, that's very difficult, you know, like at scale. Um, so you, you're kind of stuck just looking out and seeing what you can see. And there, you know, you can be fooled by correlations there too, um, you know, stuff like that. Now you can always do a little experiment in the lab and, and extrapolate that way up, right? Which is which is something that people do. You know, you run a micro experiment in, in a pit. That's pretty uh, common um, doing doing these micro level experiments, and then say, well, maybe we can learn something that from that and extrapolate to to a macro level. Okay, so, but sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes the extrapolation doesn't work, right? So it depends. Um, okay, so that's. That's sort of the general statement of causality, okay? Um, now, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, if you think about um, what we're looking at, okay, and I think, I think some of this, you know, this is related to why nations fail. You know, this, they, they don't um, necessarily tackle this head on all the time. Sometimes they're just, they're just given their narrative what happens, and I think they're getting a little bit more into the narrative mode now. And they're talking about England and, and Spain and the Habsburgs and everything like that, um, but I, but it's also something. I mean, they're of course they're aware of these issues, um, and and it's something that they the authors themselves have worked on. Okay, and I'll talk about that later on too. Um, so so it's something. This is something I think you should think about in the background also when you're um, when you're looking at uh, when when you're reading why nations fail because you know they'll they'll you know they they say stuff about the relationship between. Uh, say in England, right, the, the protection of property rights and, and the relationship to the Industrial Revolution and everything like that. And so they're, they're, they're pushing a causal story, okay, pretty explicitly, okay, but, you know, sometimes things happen. There could have been some third thing that caused both protection of property rights and the Industrial Revolution, or it could have been that the Industrial Revolution just spurred the need to track property rights because there were new ideas and they're like, okay, well, who's going to get to produce this? You know, we we should, we should uh, grant some monopoly, and so that that spurred the need, say, to have patents or something like that. So you, you could always kind of reverse some of their logic, and and it's it's not one hundred percent clear that it's it would go one way or the other. Okay, so um, all right. So let me. This is more of a slides kind of thing, um, at least initially. Okay, um, causation. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so so let me jump over to the slides. Okay, so here. Um, this is this is okay. So, first thing is is the the approach here with regards to causality. One of the most powerful uh, kind of tools uh, that people have is what's called is sort of a graphical approach. Okay, or uh, so so. And when I'm saying graph here, I'm, I mean like that's like the formal math term for what, what's essentially like a, a network or you know bubbles with arrows pointing between them, right? So, but it, it's supposed to give some idea of sort of flow, okay? So um, the approach that people use in, in the, when studying and thinking about causality, to visualize it, they use these things called directed acyclic graphs, okay? Or just graphs, okay? Sometimes they call them DAGs, like D-A-G. Um, so, and that's that's one of, that's basically what this is, okay? So this is, this is a graph in the sense of a network, okay? So, you know, any graph basically um, is going to be made up of, of nodes. Okay, um, so if you, I mean, if you if you want to think about it just generally, just as an aside. So so graph. It's confusing because if you say graph, if I graph, you know, f of x or x squared, then that's like a line, but this is not a line. Okay, so but the graph, as in like graph theory, you know, basically you have some nodes. Let's say a and b. Why not throw in C? Um, and then you got some edges, which are just these arrows pointing. So here A is pointing to B, and A is also pointing to C. Okay, so A could point to multiple things. That's fine. Okay. Um, so this is just an example, right? So I mean, with you know, I could add in another thing. Maybe B is pointing back to A or something like that. Okay, so it's just nodes and edges. That's it, okay? And from that, you can actually sit around and theorize for a million years and come up with all sorts of results, it turns out, okay? Um, yeah, so, and that that's basically graph theory, okay? The, the thinking about 
these constructs and you know it, it turns out that there's a lot of richness in this and it, it can describe a lot of situations um shows up a lot in, in stuff like computer science and things like that um but we can use it too all right and it and it's and for us it's it's more just like you know, like like when you write down an equation to formally sort of specify where your model is, rather than saying, okay, this function is increasing, but it's concave, it has constant returns of scale. If you formally write down an equation, you make things a little bit more concrete. Here, we're making things concrete in terms of how we're thinking about the causal structure of things. Okay, so um, but yeah, so just to, to get the terms down, you know, this is a graph. Okay, it's right. Let me just so the the DAG is. Directed uh, a cyclic graph. So this is a graph here. It's actually not a DAG because it's, it's it has a cycle, but I'll talk about that in a second. It's a graph. It's directed because there's arrows like a points to b, right? So you you might think um, in some other graph for whatever reason uh, things are just sort of connected. So it's like a is connected to b and b is connected to c, but there's no notion of a pointing or b pointing. It's just like they're they're connected, right? So um, maybe this is like uh, there is a rail link between city A and city B, and there's a rail link between city B and city C, right? But it's like the railway can go both ways whenever it wants, right? So um, it, it's it's an uh, undirected link, right? Um, now, if you're thinking about, okay, and then like, well, then there's a question of like, what about like social networks, right? That would be these can you, often are used to describe social connections, right? So with social networks, well, it's not clear. I mean, most you know you can think about friendship as as sort of inherently bidirectional, but in in practice, you know, there's cases where you know A is friends with C, but C is not really friends with A. Okay, um, so that is is a design decision basically. But but oftentimes these are also used to describe social networks, and so this would say like A and B are friends, B and C are friends, but A and C are not directly friends they're just kind of maybe acquaintances right but there's no direct link between them okay and then kind of the same thing here but uh there's something going on between a and c all right so um yeah so so that's those are the major sort of applications and so this is this is a graph this is directed this is undirected and then the last bit so we've covered graph we've covered directedness the last bit in the middle is is cyclicality so the acyclic means there is not a cycle, okay? And so in this case, that would, if you look at A and B, you could go to A, if you if you think about this as sort of traveling from different nodes and you can only travel where there's an arrow pointing in that direction, well, you could start at A, travel to B, travel back to A, travel to B, you could you could just keep cycling there, okay? So that would be, a, a, that, that is a cycle, A, B, A, B, A, B, B, right? So um, that's kind of a boring cycle, but you could imagine a slightly more interesting cycle if I change this up a little bit, I'm going to add a node from C to B, and I'm also going to make that node here go from B to A, right? So this is sort of a classic cycle where it's like, okay, you can go to go from A to C to B to A to C to B, and you can go around ad infinitum, right? So um, th this would be a directed cyclic graph, okay, which is not exactly what we want, okay? So... Um, we're going to really get to the thing that we want to talk about. Well, we can erase that one of those nodes, break the cycle, okay? And so here, this is actually a DAG. This is this is a directed asymptotic graph, okay? Because those those arrows have a direction. It's a graph, and there's no cycles, okay? So um, yeah, and so then this is this is the thing that we're going to use to describe causality, okay? Because well, the, I mean, a directed graph is clear. We need we need a notion of the direction of causality, okay? The cyclic part, well, you you know, it's it's actually not always clear to me that that it has to be acyclic. I mean, it's probably good to think about things in terms of causality as, as acyclic in, in the sense that there's an original thing that causes a series of consequences in sort of a line, okay? And maybe it branches out or something. But, but there is, it, it is perhaps more, uh, um, Kind of rational in some way to think about things as acyclic, okay? But often at times it does actually look like things sort of co-determine one another, and I'll talk about that too, okay? Um, all right, so that's uh, yeah, th those are graphs as, as far as as far as we'll need them, okay? And so let's let's jump back to the slides and, and actually sort of operationalize this with 
slightly more real stuff and we'll get more specific as time goes on, okay? All right, so <clears throat> what do we have here? Okay, so what we want to do in general, so this is a, this is a directed acyclic graph. You can see there, there's obviously it's a directed graph uh, and there's no cycles where you, you can go from one point to, to other points, but you can't just keep going in circles while following the arrows, okay? So that's good. Um, so what we want to do is in the most general sense, I mean, we're, we're, we're often um, looking at, you know, we have some hypothesis, basically we have a hypothesis, right? So we see, let's say some, you can think about it as in a development context, you have some uh, campaign to, you know, maybe you give cash transfers to people or you subsidize something or you give them some medicine like deworming medicine and things like that. Uh, that's like an intervention, for instance. Um, or you can think about, uh, you know, some something a little bit more um, like this policy in the U.S., for instance, would be like uh, people buying a house, right? So like that's a um, uh, thing that people are going to do and then see how does that affect them? Like does it affect the family? Does it affect their income? Does it affect the way they behave or anything like that, right? Um, like is it, you know, is it good? Uh, stuff like that. You can think about having a child, like major life events basically could be a cause here. Um, getting a new job, losing your job, stuff like that. So you can think about causes and then you can think about what's sort of the downstream effects of that. Okay. Um, and so the so a hypothesis in this case would be, well, we're going to say that this thing A or this, this cause actually does cause effect. Okay. So I'm writing the words here as if we already know the answer, but you have a hypothesis saying, okay, um, I don't know. You could say that uh, when people own a house, they're more likely to have, uh, you know, a steady job or something like that. Okay. Or you could say when when a a state, you know, impose like for for instance, there's a lot of talk about minimum wage right now. You say okay, when when a state imposes a certain minimum wage, okay, right now the discussion is around fifteen dollars an hour or not at the federal level. When a state imposes minimum wage, what happens to employment? What happens to the average wage and stuff like that, or people's wage at a certain level. So you can look at that too. Okay. Um, all right. And so that's, that's a hypothesis and it's something you can think about testing in the data. Okay. But uh, there's, you know, there's potential problems with that, right? So you can look at, um, say in the minimum wage case, I'll, I'll, I'll run with that for a second. You can look at data on this, right? And so to, to really, to even start to ask this question, you need to have kind of enough data to, to take a reasonable shot at answering it, right? So you need some variation. You can't just say, okay, well, um, you know, you, you, like for instance, if you look at the federal level and say, okay, well, there was a federal minimum wage and then let's see what happened. Well, a bunch of stuff, things are always happening. There's always, you know, there's, there's uh, climate, natural disasters, there's trade shocks, there's, um, new technology, changes to technology, political events, right? So there's always stuff happening. So to just like look at one, say, federal level change in the US, that's already kind of tough. But let's say that you, you, you had something better and you saw different states changing their minimum wage at different times, right? And there you have a, a you know, sort of a panel of, okay, here's different units, in this case, states experiencing different you know treatments, in this case, whether they have the minimum wage or not. Um, and then you can look at the outcome. You can look at the, the unemployment rate in that state. You can look at the average wages and everything like that. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so let's say that you have that, which is actually pretty reasonable that people have done that. Okay. So, um, now the, the, the first, I mean, the first thing you might do is just say, well, let's run a regression. Let's, that's the kind of the classic approach. Okay. Let's run a regression and say, uh, do states that after they impose the minimum wage, do we see, um, employment go down or go up or wages on average go down or go up. All right. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily take a, a strong stance on um, what we're going to find. Okay. I mean, um, it, you know, it's, in a lot of ways it depends, but I'm not going to necessarily talk about what we would expect, but you can, you can run this regression. Okay. So, um, and the problem really is that it's not clear that that's going to give you a, a, a meaningful answer. Okay. I mean, it'll give you an answer. You'll get a number, right? You can go tell people about it, but, but it's not clear it's going to be meaningful in the sense that it's not clear that it actually reflects this arrow. Okay. So, um, let me 
Yeah. Okay. So so imagine. Okay. So imagine we didn't have confound this whole thing. Imagine we just had cause and we just had effect. Okay. Then, if you and and let's say that describe the true world. That in the true world, you know, imposing a minimum wage uh, had a, a negative effect on employment. Okay. Hypothetically. Um, and if, you, if that was the true state of the world and you ran the regression, you would probably see a negative coefficient, assuming you did it right, okay? Um, but it, there are many possible states of the world, okay? We don't know what those are, right? Because they're sort of hidden, okay? So it might be that there's some confounding variable, okay? It might be there's something that uh, varies at the state level that influences both the setting of, of um, the uh, minimum wage and the employment rate, say, the unemployment rate, okay? Um, so it might be that, uh, I don't know, it, it could be that, for instance, um, when states are doing really well, they say, okay, well, we can kind of afford to set a minimum wage for, for whatever, maybe that's the logic internally that they use. Um, and so in that case, states that are doing well would impose a minimum wage, and actually you'd, you'd, you'd see a reduction in the, the unemployment rate, okay, which might... Um, you know, so so it would um, it would you know it would literally confound the results. So so even if there was uh, in truth like a a positive effect here, because states only do it when their economy is doing well, you might see no effect. For instance, okay. So you're gonna you're not gonna get this. You're gonna get the sum of this direct effect and some indirect confounding effect. Does that make sense, right? So you're the if you run that regression, you're gonna get both of these things, right? In some sense. Whereas you're kind of really interested in this thing, okay? Just because states that are doing well impose the policy doesn't mean that it's a good policy for everyone because not everyone is doing well at any given time, right? So um, that's sort of the idea, okay? And so, uh, well, you you know, and, and you can think about this, I mean, even in the employment context, you could think about, say, this is probably a better example, actually, uh, unemployment insurance, okay? So that's like, um, if you lose your job. Um, I mean, this, this is something that's also pretty, you know, important with COVID and everything. Um, so if you lose your job or you're unable to work, um, you can get, uh, you can apply for unemployment insurance saying, I, I can't find a job right now. Um, I, I'd like to be, you know, partially compensated for that. And so you get uh, some fraction of the wage that you had previously gotten. So, you, you know, if, if you were previously making X, they give you, you know, 50% or 30% or 50% of X, uh, for a certain period of time, eventually it runs out. Okay. Now, um, yeah. So there, uh, you might think the same thing. It's like you know, states that aren't doing well might might give out more unemployment insurance. Okay, and so you'd, you'd see that it, it would, if you just ran the regression, it would look like states that did unemployment insurance had high unemployment rates. Okay, but it might be just that when when the economy is not doing well, you kind of give out more unemployment insurance. Okay, which is actually what you see, right? So again, you have that problem that you you pick up both these arrows when really you're interested in this arrow, okay? That's, as a researcher, you're interested in this arrow, okay? Um, yeah, and, you know, okay, so then that that's the econ side, uh, you know, but this this is true generally, right? So, I, I mean, I think um, sort of, you know, there's a, if, if you think about, I don't know, for some reason, I always think about nutrition studies. And nutrition studies is a, is a real science and, and it can be done well, but I think there are a lot of not great studies out there in any field, but, you know, in nutrition science, I think is, is one of them, uh, where it's just, it's just observational. Okay. And you're like, if you eat X, then you're going to be healthy. Right. But then there's all sorts of confounders, you know, reasons why people eat X reasons that are things that are correlated with eating X that, that are also correlated with good health. Okay. And longevity. So, um, that's where you see, I don't know, you see it a lot, especially it's like, you read it in the newspaper, or your parent emails you something about it. Right. It's like, you often see these sort of ill posed, confounded studies uh, going on, okay? So so that's the general problem. It's it's known, I mean, everyone, you know, you, you, you've heard you cause, correlation is not causality. That's essentially what I'm saying here in a really long-winded way, okay? Um, and this is how you can, this is one way you can think about it in, using this this language of, of graphs is saying, okay, this is the thing we're interested in. The, the you know, is what's, is this an arrow, right? Is this, is this a zero, is there no effect here? Is there a is there a positive effect of, of A on B? Okay, um, and here you can propose different confounders. Okay, so this is the the very sort of anodyne general statement of it, 
we would put specific things in here when we were being specific about a particular setting. Okay, and so so that's what I'm going to do here, right? So it's not just like general cause; like we can be more specific. Okay. Um, all right. So so here I'm going to do, and, and again, this is this is something that's probably more relevant for thinking about why nations fail and, and some of the examples that they have there. So here I'm going to do uh, as my cause um, variable, I guess, uh, political stability. Okay, so you can think about that as. You know, how much turnover is there? Uh, how is the, the the fundamental structure of governance changing? Okay, so um, yeah, so I mean, think about like so the U.S. has been uh, politically mostly stable for quite a while. Okay, we have some rocky times lately, but pretty much stable. Um, if you think about like Italy, right? So they, their fundamental system of governments, well, that changes occasionally, but but. They, they have what you might call political instability in the sense that their parliamentary system has very rapid turnover of the prime minister, for instance, and things like that. But, I mean, the fundamental form of governance is has been around for some time. Um, but, like, you know, there are also countries that have, you know, very lengthy civil wars, uh, repeated coups, things like that. So, like, Myanmar would be an example now of a country that just underwent a coup. Had a, previously had a military government that sort of relinquished power. Um, but then you have some backsliding. So that would be an example of a country maybe that lacks so much political stability. And, and you know, next door, Thailand also had a coup a few years ago. So so that's more what I'm thinking about um, in terms of political stability or instability, as it were. Um, so and then the question is, what's the relationship between that and and just overall economic growth? OK, so <clears throat> um, on this slide. OK, so on this slide, when it. Like I guess really when I when I write the the most general the setting of the problem maybe I should just write these bubbles okay like these are two things that are uh, in the world that we think might be related okay um, when I write the arrow again I'm I'm really writing a hypothesis okay I'm writing okay my hypothesis is that you know in this case let's say increased political stability leads to economic growth pretty um, reasonable sounding hypothesis right so. Um, but maybe, you know, it's still some, you know, even if stuff is reasonable, sometimes it's good to, to think about, well, is it really true? Is, it, is that supported by the data and everything like that? Okay. So this, this is one hypothesis you can have, and this is what I'm going to call the direct causality hypothesis. It's just sort of like the obvious, okay. Um, you know, if, if you have, if you have more of this thing, which seems good, then it's going to lead to good to higher economic growth. Okay. Um, all right, so the other option, okay, this is like an alternative hypothesis, is reverse causality, okay, uh, where the error goes the other way, okay? And you can tell a story here, it's actually pretty reasonable, I think, um, which is that actually political stability is the result of, of, say, economic growth or maybe economic stability or something like that, um, in the sense that, uh, you know, if, if the economy is doing well and it's, and that, that, that uh, say that growth is somewhat widely shared, not just concentrated in, in the hands of very few, if it's somewhat widely shared, then you might think that um, people are generally going to be happy. They may attribute that positive economic growth to the to success of the current governing uh, body, whatever it may be, um, and would not agitate for, for change, right? So, um, and th that would look a lot like political stability, right? So, that's you know a, that's a, a pretty plausible I would say hypothesis okay um, and uh, yeah and, and so yeah I mean that, that that would be the positive hypothesis in the sense that more economic growth leads to more political instability okay you could probably tell a story about the the, the, the same arrow uh, here but in the in the in the negative direction um, I don't know if it's right but you you could potentially spin a story about if you have positive economic growth, well, especially if it's like, think about like um, the discovery of oil or some kind of natural resource, right? You know, if you have a big discovery like that, that's easy to sort of channel the returns from that. You might think that it would lead to increased political instability because there's going to be a bunch of different parties potentially vying for those returns, right? So you find a bunch of oil or rare earth minerals or something like that. and you know, you can 
mine those, sell them, you know, either just appropriate the returns or tax it somehow. Uh, if there's a big gold rush like that, um, then you might think that you're going to have a lot of competition for sort of controlling the ability to to siphon off that money, um, and that could be a political instability. So you you kind of you might imagine that. I mean, it's you do see political ramifications of of big resource fines, uh, especially with with petroleum and and certain types of mining. Okay, so that that's maybe another story you could tell. Okay, so the the arrow here doesn't really tell you is it a positive or a negative effect. It just says there's there's a relationship. Okay. Um, Okay, so then, uh, all right, so that's, okay, so we had direct causality, sort of the, the natural hypothesis, okay? We had reverse causality where it's like, well, actually, you know, may, maybe it's just, you know, even though we, we, we see these two things showing up in tandem, oftentimes maybe the causality is, is the opposite of what you might expect, okay? Um, and so, and I guess I should say, all the, like, I'm, I'm going to give basically four or five different classes here a graph okay now all of them share one thing which is that if you if you kind of run a regression you're going to see some po probably positive relationship okay you know the first the direct causality if you if that was the true state of the world and you ran a regression and oper operationalized this you would see a positive relationship right um if the true state of the world was the reverse causality story then if you ran a regression you'd still see a positive relationship okay um, and then the third one, well, they're all going to have that property. Okay. So, um, the third one I'm going to call a confounding factor. So this is sort of the analog of what we saw before. Okay. So here, um, there's some other thing which we may or may not observe. Okay. And I guess it's, um, it's, a, it's a problem. It's more of a problem if we don't observe it. Right. So if we do observe it, we have some hope of, controlling for it somehow and maybe picking up the true signal. If we don't observe it, then we're really kind of in a tough spot because it, it's we can't control for it in the regression. And so it, it, we, we may get a misleading answer no matter what. Okay. So in this case, this confounding factor, you know, there's many examples, but the one I'm proposing is something like social trust. Okay. So it's kind of a wishy-washy term perhaps, but, but it's something like, uh, you know, you, you, you can think about it in concrete terms as how you know how likely are other people to to trust their neighbors or you know if you, if you think about starting a business like how likely are you to trust someone to go into a business together or if you're thinking about being employed how, how likely are you to trust that your boss is going to pay you at the end of the two weeks or the end of the month okay which is is a problem in a lot of cases um, and so you can think about that as a factor which is going to influence economic activity okay going to influence just social dynamics and it's also going to influence the political system probably so that with the political system perhaps it's a bit more of a a group level trust okay so it's more like um you can think about uh perhaps you know different geographic units uh perhaps different ethnic ethnicities so if you like like going back to the case of myanmar it's a country with like many different ethnicities and there's a lot of kind of internal strife there's a lot of government oppression and stuff like that so um, you might think about that as a factor, okay? So, uh, so something like social trust, which is broadly defined, okay, um, might influence political stability, okay, in the sense that if you have a, a fractured polity, um, it may be hard to create a coalition that's that's uh, that can rule, sort of uh, that that can, you know. Uh, should I say this? I mean, it's if you have a fractured polity, then it's hard to create a coalition that can actually govern. Okay, if you can't create a coalition that can actually govern, that's sort of a recipe for for political instability. Okay, um, in the economic direction, well, I sort of mentioned that it's like you know the social trust is gonna it's gonna affect sort of finance, whether it's formal or informal. It's gonna affect employment relationships, and stuff like that. So you you might think there's something going on there. So uh, so like a more specific example for that is. Um, with regards to sort of business formation, uh, I think you, so. You see some of this in India uh, for for whatever reason. I, I think um, I mean there's many reasons, probably partially policy, but uh, you know there, there does seem to be uh, at least in India and perhaps other places um, this this tendency where firms kind of expand. They, they there's a lot of family firms basically, um, and they'll expand 
roughly as big as they can within the confines of their family. Okay, but then there's there's sort of this barrier where they kind of don't trust people uh, outside of that, and so that the the firm sort of max out in size. And so the best predictor of the firm size is actually sort of the number of sons or the number of of adults in in the extended family. Okay, so um, and that that you know that's kind of indicative of potential inefficiencies in the sense that you know a lot of the growth that you see in the US for instance it seems to be driven by a small number of really sort of highly productive firms that expand very rapidly um you know maybe because they have some better production technology okay and so if you don't let those firms expand that's going to be an inefficiency right so here in the, in this case it's sort of like there's a lack of trust and sort of everything gets sort of uh, there's a, there's a bunch of small firms and they're, you know, it's, there's no guarantee that they're going to be that productive. Okay. So there's, you're going to, you, you get a lot of sort of slightly less productive, smaller firms. Okay. And things like that. Um, so that, that's just one story. I ha I happen to just have seen a paper on looking specifically at that. So I'm sure it's true in, ma in many places too. Um, and so that's an example of this dynamic where social trust could influence economic growth. Okay. So, in total, what I'm saying is, you know, here's this confounding factor that might cause both, even if there wasn't a direct effect, you know, even if there wasn't an arrow pointing from political stability to econ growth, this alone would, would generate a positive result on that, that regression, but it wouldn't be indicative of a direct effect of political stability or vice versa. Okay, so, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit more nuanced, I guess. Um, Okay, so then the first, the, 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 this is the second last one, actually. So this is now the third, no, fourth. This is the fourth option. So you had direct, reverse, confounding, and now we have this sort of mutual feedback. So this is where we're now, this, this is technically not an acyclic graph, right? Because you could go from here to here to here to here and so on, right? So, so that's um, perhaps, it creates some issues of uh, interpretation, but I'll get to that in a minute, okay? So, um, now here it's just it's just that the true state of the world is basically I mean this is a compound hypothesis. Here it's saying the true state of the world is just that first direct uh, uh, causality plus the the reverse causality. They're just both true at the same time. Okay, so kind of when I'm talking about these, I was talking about them as if they were sort of mutually exclusive. In some sense, they're not. Right? I mean, multiple. You know, they, in this case, one and two are true at the same time. Okay, and that, there's no, nothing saying that can't happen. All right. Um, so in this case, it, it's just true that political stability somehow uh, leads to economic growth. Perhaps you know you're more willing to make investments. You're less worried about expropriation. Kind of standard. Uh, sorry, I was pointing standard. Why nations fail argument. Okay, um, and it's also true that economic growth leads to political stability. Uh, you know, for those reasons I, I, I talked about before. And so there's just sort of this. You could think about it as a, a sort of what people might call a virtuous cycle, okay? And so now here, this world is is interesting because there's sort of an instability, right? It's it's almost like the Malthus that the the what we eventually arrived at in Malthus of these two different outcomes, right? It's and, and there could be also path dependence, right? So it's like if you have political stability, right, that'll lead to more economic growth, which leads to political stability. So this this feedback mechanism okay, kind of creates uh, an all or nothing looking kind of thing. That if you have the political stability, you have economic growth, and that's a virtuous cycle. But if that gets short circuited somehow through, you know, calamity or whatever, uh, you could fall into a bad equilibrium where you lack political stability, people aren't willing to make investments, there's no economic growth, people aren't happy, and that's political instability. Okay, so this mutual, this feedback basically, and this is something we'll see perhaps more throughout the course is that, that when you have this type of feedback, uh, it, it leads to multiple equilibria, first of all, the good or the bad or whatever you want to call it. Um, something like an instability, you're prone to shocks that, that can have long-term effects. And, and I guess what that really we would call is, is path dependence, okay? So path dependence means um, your initial conditions matter, like in that Malthus model that we found. Uh, that, that what happens to you in the past matters. It's not just that, you know, you get shocked and then you return to equilibrium. You get shocked and you change the equilibrium entirely. Okay, so that's that's path dependence. Um, I think they talk about that later on in Why Nations Fail. I can't 
I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, I, th- I think they do talk about path dependence later on. Okay, so um, yeah, but actually, we're gonna we're gonna at the end of the course or for our last book, uh, this, this Dream Machine book, actually touches on some of this because it, it 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 goes into some of the history of 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 thinking about these kind of things in the, in the fifties which sort of circuitously relates to the internet. Um, but, but we'll talk about these, this notion of feedback really. Okay. Um, okay. So, all right. So that was it. And then the last one is just like a semi joke one, which is just like it, many, many different things could be true. You know, if you think about all the possible arrangements of arrows between three nodes, it's actually a lot. Uh, I don't know. Hundreds, I would imagine. Okay, so I mean, there's a, there's a mathematical formula for it. I'm not going to compute it, but a lot. Okay, so in this case, this is just like everything is true at once. And in some sense, you know, there's always an effect, no matter how small it is, between any two things within reason, right? So when 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 we when we draw these arrows, we're kind of saying there's there's an effect that's important enough to kind of care about. Okay, but in truth, maybe everything affects everything. Okay, um, and there's nothing saying that can't be true. All right, the world is sort of very complex, okay, and and so, in some sense, it's inescapable. Uh, but oftentimes, there are things that are clearly more important than other things. Okay, we can we can separate those out. Okay, um, so we're gonna assume as we're gonna proceed as if the world is not just like fundamentally chaotic, and we can at least extract some el- elements of truth from it. Okay, um, all right. So then, so th- those that's sort of my break down of the different options, okay? Uh, now, now that we've kind of gone through all those, you know, we can also think about ways to, to resolve this, okay? And so this is where we're gonna get a little bit more into kind of the methods, all right? And so a lot of this sort of is explicitly or alludes to kind of things in econometrics, okay? So, or, or statistics in general, okay? Um, but 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 we can I mean we can still talk about it without having to go into the nitty gritty t- details of how you would implement it. But but you know there is an econometric sort of backing to, to everything that I'll, that I'll be talking about here. Okay, so what are we going to do? Um, so we want to resolve this, and we want to figure out okay, well, how how can we actually determine causal relationships in the world? Okay, now you know I, I was talking before you know. Econ is is mostly in macro, especially is mostly observational, um, and so it's we're in a bit of a tough spot, right? Uh, you know, if it wasn't observational, if it, the, the I guess the opposite, the opposite of observational here is is experimental. Right? Observational is you're stuck, you just see stuff and you fi- you try and figure it out. Experimental is you can go in and interact with the system, and and see what what happens when you change things. Okay, so um, the experimental approach is just that. Okay, you're a scientist, so you can run an experiment. And just see what happens, and that's well. It's actually really complicated, but it's like it, it's a valid approach. Okay, um, so so that would be the ideal. It's just that that's not so feasible. But if you want to think about what does an experiment look like in this language of of directed acyclic or directed cyclic graphs or whatever in this graphical language, uh, well, it would basically be like okay, so you have some intervention. Okay, so you you shock the system or you set up an experimental apparatus of some sort. And that leads to some outcome, okay? And you're you can even draw the scientists as part of the system. You're the scientist. You induce a change in X. You know, so if you're a literal, you know, like physical chemist scientist or something like that, maybe you you uh, change the temperature. You you change the proportion of CO two in a glass box or something like that, right? And then you see some change in the outcome, okay? So like the the classical. Arrhenius experiment, which basically gives you the sort of micro level idea of global warming, is that if you if you have a, a glass box filled with air and you increase the amount of CO two in it, the the equilibrium temperature is going to go up. Okay, so that's an example of like that's a micro experiment, right? Uh, that tells you basically there's at the micro level there's a greenhouse gas effect, right? You have more CO two, you have you have a higher temperature. Um, and the inter- you know that intervention was changing the proportion of CO two. The scientists did it, um, and the the outcome was the temperature. Now the scientists didn't change the temperature directly, hopefully, right? Um, they just changed X and then in, and observed the change in Y. Okay, so that's a real true, sort of properly done experiment. Okay, now that's interesting because it also relates to this micro macro notion, right? It relates you know, if you have this micro experimental result and you're like, oh well. Maybe that's true for the whole world, 
you know, because the whole world's basically just a bunch of air in, in the atmosphere, at least. Um, and, you know, it's something, well, it's it's just not always clear whether it extrapolates. You know, in this case, it, it does. Okay. And people have done a ton of work to sort of demonstrate that. But, but um, you know, it's it's a question that, that you need to, to sort of ask. Okay. So um, this would be the ideal, but we can't really do it in macro. Okay. We can, well, sometimes people have tried. Okay. Uh, in the sense of there have been big macro experiments or like there have been, there obviously are big macro kind of experiments. I mean, anytime someone implements policy, uh, that's sort of an experiment because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Okay. Um, it's, it's not a, a great experiment because you usually just do it in one place and that's kind of it. You have an N equals one study, which isn't so good statistically. Um, but sometimes actually, uh, uh, places will sort of randomize, like like you know, if, if you remember the um, Brandeis, probably Justice Brandeis uh, had this thing about states as laboratories, right? Whereas one of the virtues of, of federalism in the U.S. was that different states can try different things and see what works, and and that actually reveals information, right? He even used the word laboratory, uh, alluding to an experiment um, that reveals information that could be useful for the entire country or even the entire uh, world, right? So. Um, and so that's cool. That's that's great, actually. Uh, the the issues arise with that endogeneity. Remember, I said that states that are doing well may be more likely to implement, say, unemployment insurance or other policies. So there's a lot, there's still a statistical confounding factor. Not to take away from Justice Brandeis's point there, um, there is still potentially a confound confounding issue. Um, but uh, but yeah. So so you people are kind of always running experiments. Okay, if you think about at the country level, right? So you have like, we've been reading about a lot about colonial, colonialism, colonial endeavors by the, let's see, the um, European powers, but not exclusively. Uh, and, you know, there, I mean, that's kind of an experiment. You go in and basically just change the government. Okay. You redraw borders of countries and everything like that. So, um, but again, those are, those are often kind of N equals one experiments, unless you think about all of colonialism as a big group of exper uh, interventions. Okay. But it's, it's, there's so much variation; it's kind of tough to do that. Okay, so there, there, there are definitely big macro movements and and changes in policy, but there, you wouldn't call them experiments, I think, because they're endogenous. Okay, so um, but you can hope. The hope is that you can find some analog to a proper scientific experiment. Okay, so um, sorry. Uh, so you can find some analog to to a proper scientific experiment. And that's what people sometimes call a natural or historical experiment. Okay, so there it's like, okay, well, maybe there's something that happened, a historical factor. It could be like, um, I don't know, like a change in climate, right, that, that affected a wide variety of, of countries or something like that uh, differently. Okay, it could be some natural disaster, perhaps. Um, you know, we, we've seen that, for instance, the, in... In Why Nations Fail, they talk about this large volcanic eruption that resulted in sort of like a year-long winter and stuff like that. So you can think about big, big historical shocks like that, um, or you can try and think about colonial interventions in a, in a framework like this. So this is sometimes difficult, okay? But you can think about something that induced changes, okay, uh, in say different countries, okay. Um, so, so you, I mean, think about weather. I guess is you know you have different. Historically, you, you have different weather patterns and weather, weather is something that exists. Well, wet, weather is influenced by humans, but uh, most of the time it's not. So like, you know, climate in the modern era is influenced by humans, but historically it really wasn't. Um, and so you, you can think about, you know, that as being sort of exogenous external driving force, which, you know, maybe it, there's change in climate and it changes uh, political stability or something, right? Because um, it, the, the agricultural production is disrupted and, and so on, right? So you can think about some shock externally, historically, that influences your, your X of interest, like your, your exogenous factor, and see how that changes Y, okay? But what you need, the critical thing, you need the thing to only influence y, uh, X, but not Y directly, right? So you, if, you know, if you think about this, the scientists, you can have the scientists changing the CO2 and also, you know, putting a lighter under the glass, or Bunsen burner under the glass box, right? You need them to be separate in that dimension. Okay, so uh, you want to find something that influences X, your, your independent variable, 
but doesn't influence your outcome variable. Okay, and if you if you could find that, right, then that's great because then you can actually it's it's as if you were, and if it's random, then it's as if you were performing an experiment, you, even though you didn't. You just looked at it ex post. Okay. Now the big problem is like, how do you prove that this thing is not aligned? How do you prove that there's no line going from this, say, climactic factor to y? That's difficult. I mean, you can make arguments. Okay. Um, sometimes sort of from theory or just from kind of basic logic. Okay. Um, there are ways to do that, and we'll discuss that. But but it's it's something that you can you can possibly do. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, just in the last few minutes of class here, I'll give one example, which is actually, f this is, uh, it's from a paper, I think it's uh, by exactly Echimoglu and Robinson, the, the two um, economists that wrote Why Nations Fail. Um, they, yeah, I think they, they talk about this later on. So um, it's from the same duo. I think they might have an additional call out there, but essentially what they say is they're, they're, they're doing this natural experiment and they're kind of using not just like naively using colonialism, but they're using differences in the way that colonialism was implemented or differences in the ways that these European powers expanded out and how they set up governments when they did so. Okay. So, and, and the big thing that they use, um, is settler mortality. So this is sometimes called like the settler mortality approach. Okay. The, the idea that they, they're, they're proposing, and uh, essentially, it, this relates to this, the ex extractive institution stuff that they, they talk about, okay? Um, but, but essentially what they say is that, <clears throat> first of all, uh, you know, settlers are the people that come from the European countries to go live in like Argentina or whatever, okay? Um, and so when the settlers go to these countries, they actually die of sort of alarmingly high rate from disease, okay? You know, we, so we know that anytime you you go to a region that has you know, that has historically not been much or any interaction between the peoples from those regions, there's new diseases that affect one but not the other, and vice versa, right? So we saw this when the Europeans came to the Americas because the Native Americans were not um, res they they had no immunity basically to smallpox, okay, and so there's just like a devastating impact there. Um, but you also see that when Europeans come to say South America, there's a bunch of, well, you know, sort of tropical diseases mostly that they have no prior exposure to um, or immunity to. And so they get pretty hard. Okay. So if you, you know, if you're reading about it, like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was reading something uh, last year about sort of the, the opening of trade in, in China with, you know, basically with uh, England and the, the treaty ports that they had there in Hong Kong and, and elsewhere. Um, it's just a lot of like, you know, going along some guys, the, the console there, up, and then he died. Okay, so it's just like people die sort of an alarming frequency of, of disease and they get a fever or whatever. So um, that varies from country to country though, right? A lot of it is sort of like tropical, non-tropical and things like that. So um, so that there's variation there, okay? And so that, and that their hypothesis is that induces them to set up different types of government. So when you have the high mortality, it's sort of like, just sort of like you go in set up the bare minimum government, don't have any property right protections, and you just extract silver, say, in the case of the Spain, right? So um, that would be like the high mortality, whereas the lower mortality, it's more like you go and set up a, you know, a more robust system of property rights um, as if you're going to stay there you know, for, for some time. And that's the variation. They're saying so this change in center mortality leads to different institutions, and then they look at the, the resulting impact uh, on economic growth in the long run. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So, so the question, and then the question is, is there a direct effect? Okay. That, that's a little nuanced. Um, and also hotly debated, but yeah, we're out of time. So, uh, we'll talk about that. Is there a direct effect and, and is this whole setup valid and what can we learn from it? Okay. Um, and we'll look at the data too. Okay. So we'll, we'll yeah, we'll leave that till next time. If you can't wait, it's in, it's in the lecture notes anyway. So, um, but we, we can go into more detail on that next time. Okay, so, all right, that's it. I'm already over time. Uh, so I'll see you on Thursday.